Welcome to the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast, all about the what of fused filament fabrication. Hey everyone, welcome back to WTFFF. I'm Tom Hazard here with my co-host Tracy. Today we're going to talk about one of our favorite subjects. Furniture! Yeah, yeah. You know, 3D printed furniture. Right, so we told you we were going to come back and do some episodes whenever we felt there was something like really strong, really exciting, and really interesting to, to talk about. And Tom and I started this podcast, and we were designing loads and loads of furniture at that time. And so, you know, originally I said, why are we going to buy a printer? We don't need a 3D printing furniture is never going to happen. It's happening. It's happening. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's happening at a large scale. And it's really exciting to see. So there's this new company, a startup. Admittedly, you know, they say, hey, they're a startup, although they're well-established and they're selling furniture. You can buy it from them today. And it's called Model Number. Yeah, and so today we're going to talk to Jeffrey McGrew. He's the co-founder and CTO of Model Number, and he's out to make the world a more interesting place. He has a knack for problem solving, building unique and talented teams, and leveraging technology to make great things. He's an expert in digital fabrication, has been building and solving design problems for clients for over 20 years, and his boutique design build company, Because We Can, has been doing that as an are in the architectural build area for a long time. Uh, quick to challenge himself and others, Jeffrey is a licensed award-winning California architect who studied architecture and biochemistry at the University of Arizona and the San Francisco Institute of Architecture. I am really glad and you know that he came across and we watched the videos of the products being built. So we oh, have yeah. a couple time of time lapse videos of some of the actual pieces of furniture being 3D printed. Some that are entirely 3D printed and some are just some parts that are 3D printed, but it's it's pretty cool stuff and um, custom machines. Right. So he's really open. He talks all about the different ways that they're processing, what they're using, how they're doing it, the challenges that they face. So we'll be sharing all of that for you in the interview. And then tune back at the end because you're not going to miss Tom's and my sort of assessment of how things are going in the furniture industry and what some of the things that they're really doing right or wrong that might be going on. And so we'll share that recap with you at the end. Hey, Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to have you on WTFFF. Oh, thanks for thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. So I don't know if you know this, but we have a huge history in furniture. So when we saw 3D print furniture, we were like, we oh. have to we have to interview you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh, I had no idea. I had no idea. What's it, what's your history in furniture? Oh my gosh. We've I mean, ever since college really designed uh, furniture and then early in each of our careers worked for furniture either manufacturers or importers oh, wow. and mm -hmm. you know everything from office furniture to residential furniture uh all different types uh, so desks i was lucky and chairs, yeah desks you know? and chairs but i was lucky enough to work on the aaron chair which everybody knows is oh wow fairly popular go. yeah super so, cool super cool and tom and i designed the most popular chair that you buy every single day still at costco and nice. uh, has tons of plastic parts on it and that's all we could kept thinking about it <laughs> Wow, 3D printing would have been so useful, at least big format 3D printing would have been so yeah. useful when we were prototyping this thing, right? And we couldn't even prototype <laughs> it that way because it didn't really exist. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And you had to do a ton of work to set up for injection molding and a bunch of other stuff. And so yeah. that iterative that iterative loop, it gets to be really long, right? That's you know? right. Yeah. So we've been waiting for somebody to really take on large mm -hmm. format printing we're really taking it on in the furniture industry because mm -hmm. it made sense to us um for, you know for i think the really unique reason is that you know there's so much waste there's oh, so yeah. much that doesn't get sold there right now we are having a huge furniture shortage so if anyone doesn't understand what's going on in the supply chain but there are furniture shortages everywhere you can't go mm -hmm. into stores you can't buy beds you can't buy chairs just they're they're not yeah. coming over in the containers right now so you're made to order without the waste that is oh. correct and that's actually a big inspiration behind the whole thing so so my background is in architecture and we did a ton of like sustainable interiors and stuff around here in the Bay Area and it was always heartbreaking to see how much waste there was. Like you mentioned office furniture, you know, it wasn't a, uncommon that you'd see them throwing out an entire floor's worth of cubes and chairs just because they were refreshing the space, you know. And then, you know, like you were saying, there's also a ton of manufacturing waste where you make a bunch of stuff and then nobody buys it and now you're stuck with a bunch of stuff. Um, so and you shipped it. So you spent all that money shipping it and wasting all that, right. all that right. energy. 
Yeah, yeah. So a big part of a uh, big part of our kind of uh, trifecta, you know, if you will, of behind model number. One of them is very much in the fact that because we're making everything on demand through digital manufacturing, digital fabrication, uh, we our product risk is really low. Um, like we don't we don't have to guess what people want to buy and then guess how much they want to buy and then go make a whole lot of it and then hope to God that we sell it all. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Or sell most of it, right? Yeah. And then have that as our loop. Uh, instead, you know, we can iterate on product very, very quickly uh, based off of direct feedback. Um, we're launching new products like kind of at a ridiculous pace. I mean, really every month we're launching at least two or three new products. Uh, and, I'm, and when I say products, I don't mean like small stuff. Like, I mean, we're doing small stuff too, but like we have like five more outdoor pieces, like from lounge chairs to dining chairs to loungers and other stuff all coming out in the next month. You know, so our iterative loop can be way shorter than it was like to your point earlier, you know, it could take a year or more to launch a single chair. Um, we're taking about a month or less to launch uh, something on par. Um, now it's not as complex as an adjustable ergonomic chair. That would be something no. that would probably take us longer than a month. But on the ergonomic front, that's another really interesting thing that we've been playing around with. And that it actually turns out that the problem is how you sell it and how you have the conversation with the customer. But um, we can make chairs that fit you ergonomically perfectly if you just tell us like a few things about your body. Um, so we actually have a couple lounge chairs that we're currently offering that if you tell us a few things like your height and your, you know, few other things, then it can actually fit you just outright. So again, <laughs> Like when we do get to making uh, ergonomic office furniture, one of the things that we'll be able to do is have a lot less moving parts out of it. So the design itself will be a lot more sustainable and a lot more friendly and a lot. Yeah. So so it's so it's exciting. Yeah. Being able to print lar large scale has been really exciting. Well, I imagine one of the other things that is an advantage of the way you're doing it is you don't have to make everything vanilla because when we were creating furniture that's selling at mass market retail. Yeah you've got you know it's selling to so many people and being in every store you can't really make a lot of the decisions especially regarding color that you'd like to because you've got to make sure it sells everywhere and like you said you got to sell through all your inventory that you produced mm -hmm. so you're mm -hmm. are, are you actually making them like to order yeah. so color can be a personal choice yes yeah actually we're making them to order Right now, we have a certain range of colors that we're offering, and that's more of a limitation on the fact that um, we're not, so the, the, the large format printing uses uh, injection molding pellets, essentially. It's all pellet-based. It's not oh, wow. filament-based. So we're buying, but the problem is that your minimum order of pellets is something called a Gaylord, which yes. is like an entire pellet load, like a thousand pounds worth of pellets, right? So, um, and so we're buying a bunch of raw material uh, that I'll, I'll get into that. And then we're color and then we're separating it out and colorizing it to different colors, uh, you know, because we don't have the in-house capability yet to be able to make like custom custom colors. So we're working with a vendor that mixes it for us and does the colors for us. And then we have a certain amount of each color that we run through. But yes, to your point, we can easily do different colors. And we're starting uh, right now, most of what is visible on the website and that we're selling is all, you know, direct to consumer. Um, we do have initiatives that we have going on that are direct to like business to business things. Um, and in some of those totally would could do like, oh, you want your custom company colors and a bunch of different stuff. We could easily we used that, to do Coca-Cola you know? red all the time as Herman Miller like, when I we used could to work do, there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we could totally do, yeah, yeah. So we could totally do custom colors for different clients. It'd be really easy. And uh, we are working towards in the future being able to do uh, programmatically, you know, because you can see some of the pieces on our site have like a fade, you know, like yeah, I saw a gradient, yeah, yeah. So we're doing those gradients and such, and we're 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 working towards getting it to where that would actually be programmatically controlled uh, on a line by line basis as well. So you could feed different, have you know, the material feed be more complex, where it's like multiple colors that are getting metered on demand into the machine uh, itself, so the machine can be mixing the colors as it's as it's going on the fly. Um, which which is something that we're working towards, but probably won't have until like later this year, I'm hoping, because uh, we got a lot that we're doing. I mean, as it is, we're having to build the printers ourselves uh, because there's only a handful of machines on the market that can even do what we need in terms of the scale and the speed and, and everything else. And those machines that are available are, uh, that can do furniture scale pieces reliably and at an industrial scale, you know, pace uh, cost 
a lot of money. And so the economics when you're making furniture start becoming really challenging. Hence why we're just building our own machines in house uh, to be able to do a lot of this stuff because it just was the viable thing to do. I would love to just be able to buy machines instead, but uh, we're probably <laughs> no. a couple of years away from that being a reality. We, so. You know, I think that that's the, so, the whole issue. So when we started this podcast seven years ago and, you know, 600 plus episodes ago, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we were seeing. We're just like, it's still, everything still has to be advanced. Everything still hasn't quite come to that place. What were some of those challenges that you faced along the way and besides the machines and trying to really get to the level yeah. you wanted? Yeah, um, a big one is the um, pellet based extrusion. So that's a fairly new thing. And it's something that's not really fully understood yet by the industry. So I'm um, talking to one of our vendors that uh, sells us some of our raw material, and they're pretty familiar with the pellet printing process, because they've been working directly with Oak Ridge National Labs and their whole like large format printing stuff that they're doing. We're working with them as well with Oak Ridge. I mean, and the idea of it is, is sound where it's like, okay, we're going to take this technology that traditionally is horizontal and produces like rain gutters that are just an endless extrusion into a die of a shape, right? Um, we're going to take that and we're going to try to make it as small as possible and mount it on a gantry so we can move it around or have it mounted and have a table editor that moves around or whatever to basically make that into the 3D printing head, right? And there's a bunch of stuff around like, well, how, you know, how do you make a micro extruder work well? how do you get the material you know properties to be what you need uh, the strength that you need the wall thickness that you need the surface quality that you need like all the same things you struggled that we saw 3d printing struggling with like seven eight years ago with the filament printers but are now pretty dialed in right like now you can go buy a prusa and just like out of the box it's going to make pretty decent things right you know what i mean um because they've spent a ton of effort dialing in everything in terms of like you know speed and nozzle sizes and materials and everything like that we're in that space where it's like oh okay there's like you know i mean one of the um micro extruders that we bought had a single digit serial number on it because i think it was like the seventh one philabot like ever made <laughs> right and so and and we're discovering things with them where we're like you know like having issues and problems with them and reaching out to philabot and philabot is learning with us because it's not like like again you know we have like the seventh or sixth one that they ever made so you know we're kind of in this together <laughs> and so there's a lot of stuff around micro uh around the micro extruder and around pellet based extrusion that's been a, a huge learning curve to get uh, to figure out. Um, what about one. material and material strength? Material strength has been uh, hasn't been too bad. That's one largely just that you know the we're trying to stick with primarily using different PLA formulations because again we're trying to be like super sustainable. That's a big part of what we're trying to do. And so a lot of it is just trying to work within the limitations of that material and learning a lot about like wall thicknesses and other things that are going to give us and geometries that are going to give us those strengths and be able to work in the you know applications we want want them to work in. A lot of that just comes down to the more of the design side. I mean, it's not that much different than like one of the vendors, I, sorry, I was going to say a moment ago, one of the vendors that we worked with a bunch uh, who really understands this space says that, you know, where we are today with all of this is kind of where injection molding was like 50, 60 years ago, where it was kind of a black art. You had certain engineers that knew it really well and could like communicate like, oh, you need to change these details on your piece to get this to come out really nice. And now injection molding is, is really, I mean, it's still a, a, a refined art. There's a craft there, but um, but it's just much more understood by so many more people that it's easier to like get really good injection molding tooling, you know, from people than it was like 50, 60 years ago. And that's kind of where we're at now. So it's a combination of the materials, but also like the design and the, the shape of the pieces for their strength and, and everything like that, that we've been going through and learning a ton around. Um, the other thing that we've been learning a ton around on the customization front is just how to sell customized products to people, which is Build a whole process. other, yeah. And that's been a huge, uh, you know, that's a huge thing as well. Um, Cause as you know, from, from, you know, working at Herman Miller, furniture is a really saturated market. There's a ton of stuff out there. And so um, the, just the marketing and sales side of offering a new thing to this very saturated existing market has been a huge learning curve as well. So it has nothing to do with 3D printing at all. It has everything to do with like, how's, how do you interact with the customer? How do you show these pieces? What, you know, what are they, what, what can you really connect with that they really want to buy? Like all of that kind of, uh, you know, kind of standard business one-on-one sorts of stuff. So. It's amazing yeah. how all these things have to come together in order to have a product line that's going to sell and, and really a company that's sustainable. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so but that's an incredible stuff. Now, I imagine doing print on demand product, and you've also are creating all these new designs, new materials, machines that are extruding pellets instead of filament. Mm-hmm. I imagine you've had to do a lot of trial and error experimentation, especially for strengths, I would think, dealing especially with seating. I mean, something where you're putting your entire body in it. Yep. And what about weight limitations and all these things? I mean, you, we unfortunately in this world, we learn the hard way that, you know, strength in materials and reliability of engineering only comes through failure really what is the breaking point so can you share some of your exploration in that with some of these products yeah basically um we test everything even though it's not necessarily required by some of our products we test everything to the bifma standards that are out there right now for commercial furniture so it's a lot of like you know put a lot of weight on it and drop it on its corner from a certain height at a certain angle, you know, and like these sorts of things. So there's all these standards that you run through for testing. Um, so yeah, so we, we stress test and break everything. And, and a fun little side story about that is my prior experience as an architect uh, running a design build firm that did a lot of custom interiors and a lot of furniture and other things. Cause basically we were like a boutique architecture firm that had in-house digital fabrication shops. So we'd make a lot of stuff for our own projects. And I remember vividly the first time we got a really successful full size print off of off of our our, our uh, in-house printer that we built um that was for like a little table you know it's like a little end table and and our lead industrial designer at the time we're all like celebrating it we're looking at it and stuff and he's like this is great and he throws it on the ground as hard as he can to break it like in front of everybody because it's like oh yeah this is just one of hundreds like it's got to survive you know and, and coming from this architecture world where you're making one it's super precious and you don't you know, treat it like that was really shocking, but really great, you know, in terms of this, like, oh yeah, like it's not that it's disposable, but like, you know, if you're really trying to make this work, it has to really work. And there you go. Well, especially when sustainability is part of your mission, part of the statements of what you're making, you do need to make sure that things are going to last. And some of that comes with material, but that's why it's better to be choosing materials that are already known, already been out there, already already rated for outdoor because you have color fade, you have fading issues, you have strength deterioration that happens from sun. Um, Mm -hmm. So all of those things, you know, if you're not using that, that's why you have to consult in. And this is such a challenge you've taken on. You have to consult in with the best of all of those industries to try to put something together (laughs) and then why you end up having to custom build your machine to accept all those things right right exactly exactly yeah 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 i mean like we're working with oak ridge national labs we're working with a couple of major material vendors we've been working with a bunch of different people but yeah i mean essentially we're just hoping to uh you know kind of like i was saying offer this very new product family of products to you know this existing market and uh, trying to kind of move things towards what we're calling healthy furniture, just in general. Like, you know, it's not just that the piece is sustainable, but it's also that it's non-toxic. Um, there's a lot in the furniture industry, as you know, there's a, a lot of greenwashing, you know, like we'll, we'll, we'll plant a tree for every couch you buy sort of thing, but the couch is like made of urethane foam and it's going to like off gas and be nasty its whole life. And, you know, uh, that sort of thing, right? You know, like trying to not go that route and actually make stuff that's genuinely better, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah off-gassing yeah. is a huge issue. I mean, anybody who's ever bought a piece of furniture, certainly at retail, especially something you have to put together yourself, you open mm-hmm. up that box and watch out. I mean, you really understand what it smells like inside of a Asian furniture factory, for instance. Formaldehyde and all kinds of stuff is in there. And, you know, I mean, we've made a lot of improvements. There's been uh, the California Air Resource Board, CARB standards. Yeah, Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's been a lot of progress, but there's still so much farther to go. So, yeah, so the material choices make a big difference. You know, one of the things that I really like that you've done, Jeffrey, is done like wood uh, plastic combos, steel yes. plastic combos that you combine materials. Tom and I have always been a big fan that one of the ways to get 3D printing, just because mm-hmm. in its concept, there's so much plastic there. And even though they should, we accept injection molded plastic all the time, but mm-hmm. combining materials can make something more ex- successful at that higher price point, which we require for some of these custom-made products. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and that was part of it too, was it was perceived value, right? You know, like, you know, by adding wood elements to certain ele- uh, to certain items, it did make it ha- make the perceived value go up a lot higher. Um, also, part of it was just like, 
you know, a lot of when we were first starting out and we were doing a bunch of research into what was possible in this space and uh, looking at what we might be able to do, uh, there were some boutique, uh, smaller companies that were 3D printing furniture, right? You know, there's like Nagami, there's some great stuff out there. Um, but the two problems that we saw a lot kind of over and over again is one is that, I mean, you know, you can buy this 3D printed chair, but it costs $10,000, right? And we're like, okay, that's, that's great. That's, you know, kudos for that high design thing. You know, I love it. As an architect, you know, I love the Zaha Hadid couch that costs $40,000, but the designer in me is like, okay, if you can't make an awesome couch with a $40,000 budget, like, yeah. <laughs> I totally, like, I totally get yeah, you here, Jeffrey. Yeah, I like, you know, I feel for yeah. like forty thousand dollars, it should print itself for you as an entertainment piece. Right. Every right. time you go to sit on it, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then the other problem that we saw happen a lot, which is more relevant to what we're talking about right now, is um, a lot of these three D printed uh, furniture items that that different artists had done or designers had done. Is it almost looked like you took a three D rendering and just cut and pasted it into the photo? Right. It was this very like, I mean, it was really striking, which is awesome, but at the same time, uh, didn't necessarily look like furniture, right? It looked like a 3D printed piece sitting in someone's living room, right? And we we're like, well, you know, to your point that you're saying before, like, if we want this to actually be mainstream, because I know this is super pretentious, but basically, we're hoping to grow up to be Herman Miller, like, that's literally, like, what model number, we're like, okay, Herman Miller back in the 40s used, you know, used modern design with new materials and production techniques to come out with a whole family of new products that people hadn't really seen before that served, like, new niches, you know, and then that was able to make them grow into this, like, giant company they are now, we're literally like, okay, that's, kind of what we're trying to do, <laughs> you know? And uh, and so to that point, we were like, okay, the stuff has to look, I mean, it can look striking, it can look really new, but it has to look like furniture. And so we were actually really inspired by, you know, like uh, just as an example, you know, the like the Ames design stuff from that Herman Miller produced, a lot of it was the same where it's like, okay, it's very striking, but it still looks inviting. It still looks like furniture. You know, and by no means are we like, you know, riffing off of Eames designs, but it was the spirit of it that we were inspired by to be, have it be a real, you know, look like a real piece. And so a lot of that was the wood and the, you know, printing together. Um, and we have a range of items, you know, some are entirely 3D printed, some are actually entirely digitally fabricated through CNC subtractive fabrication and don't have any 3D printed parts at all. Um, and then most, most of the things are somewhere in the middle, you know, where it's combining the different things together. So. That's interesting. I was going to ask you about that. You know, having looked at your line on the website, it did appear like there were some pieces that maybe didn't have any 3D yep. printed parts of them. So how central to your mission is using this new material uh, and this new manufacturing process? Is it really a requirement? that it included? I mean, I guess I've sort of answered my own question in that you have some that don't, but I mean, how how important is this new process and material to your, I guess, both design mission and overall mission as a company? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. The, the way to put it is that, uh, you know, the, there's kind of three big parts of our company of what we're trying to do. One of them is just, you know, to produce everything on demand using digital fabrication, right? Um, and that is, you know, that fully, I mean, 3D printing is a huge part of that. Um, but there's also subtractive fabrication. There's actually um, manipulative uh, digital fabrication that like folding metal stuff that doesn't get talked about as much as the other stuff does, but is also equally interesting for different types of products and such. There's uh, a whole wheelhouse of stuff there. And uh, I mean, really the thing for us more on the how much 3D printing is involved in some of our products is more of the, the kind of line of accessibility, if you will. Like, like it's just become viable in the last couple of years to be able to 3D print things at the scale we are you know, using the pellet-based printers and developing all this stuff that we've developed in-house to be able to do this. I could see maybe, I, I'm hoping like, um, what was it? Uh, Forest just released a 3D printed wood that they're doing using a binder jetting technology where they're using um, wood flower with a, a Lingden as the uh, as the actual binder. So it's 100% natural because they're using a natural uh, based polymer that uh, 
you know, to kind of make wood. We bought some of their samples, you know, we've been playing around with it. And I'm friends with um, Ron, who's part of their, Ron Real, who does amazing work because he's here at UC Berkeley. Um, so we've known each other for a long time and, um, you know, they're doing incredible stuff. So I'm like, okay, I could totally see a future where in a couple of years uh, we could be binder jetting a bunch of stuff, right? Um, the problem for us really is what it boils down to is like the economics of, you know, the, the piece that we're making and the price of it and the production technology, much like uh, any other, uh, you know, standard kind of furniture production, is just we're fully embracing the digital fabrication uh, side well, of it. In a way, you could not have so. gotten, you know, through unfortunate circumstances, actually lucky right now in that the reset in the marketplace is happening from a pricing standpoint, from because we're having such a supply chain problem in general. So we're having price increases go up across the board in furniture and all kinds of low end furniture. So we're starting to see a reset in pricing, which I think is going to be, be to benefit. Then yeah. the lead times are so extended for what is what used to be, oh you know, used yeah. to be like one to three days, you can have anything you want. And no, now we're now. If yeah. you're, you're lucky if it's one to three months, like yeah. that feels like, you know, wow, I'm lucky I got a bed in three months. Woohoo. You right. know, so it's right. just, it's just amazingly difficult right now. And that's helping mm -hmm. to reset the marketplace for you. I think that's going to give you a, a chance to get some traction in. I hope so. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's kind of, you know, right now it's amazing not to shill us too much, but like right now today you can order a dining table customized to the inch and get it in like two to three weeks. You know, for a totally <laughs> custom, like sustainable hardwood dining table that you like sized exactly to the size you wanted, how you wanted all of that, um, which is kind of stunning. Like nobody else is doing that right now, you know. Um, <laughs> right. So, this is yeah. this is this is your, your marketplace is just ripe right at this moment right now because there are people desperately out there. I, um, I, may I make the strong suggestion that Tom and I have been searching for a bed for over a year. Nice. Oh, that's yeah, how well, bad. Well, mostly because they're so badly designed, number yeah. one. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure well, you you're familiar with that. They're so badly designed out there. And then number two, you can't get anything new in stock anywhere. So like there's wow. not you can't even order okay, anything yeah. and hope to get it. Unless so. you're going to go completely <laughs> custom, which is another route right. to go. But I mean, if you're looking for something just a high quality manufactured item of a certain quality material, even if you could have gotten it a year ago or two years ago, the inventory levels, and then they're not bringing older models back in stock. They're purely in and outs. And if you don't yeah. buy the size beds you needed at the time. Well, they aren't even making a full range of sizes because yeah. they just aren't bothering. They're like, we're just going to go and make queen only. And then everybody else is, you know, out of luck. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. that's, yeah, that's, you know, so there's some like little pockets of market right now that I, that we've totally. been seeing like that's that. Yeah. yeah, we're we're working really hard. Uh, this is a little bit of a of a hint, but we're working really hard. So we're we have a bunch more outdoor stuff we're coming out with, and then the next thing that's coming out after that is a whole like couch uh, system, uh, for the same reason. Because right now, getting a decent couch that is the size that you want is impossible. Um, so it's a whole same idea, highly customizable, fully sustainable, really healthy. Um, and then after that, we'll probably get into beds and other stuff. So, well, let us know because we're <laughs> so. still, we'll probably still be in the okay. market there. <laughs> but thanks for that. Thanks for the tip. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Oh, absolutely. yeah. When you want to talk about juvenile furniture, we'll, we'll have a whole nother conversation because oh, yeah. that's a whole nother area. Let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So, well, you know, this is, it's so interesting that, that this, we, we were excited because I mean, we really got into 3d printing with this idea of what were we going to do for our clients? And now we have a totally different business, right? We're here. We are, we're all, we do is podcast all day. <laughs> and so, you know, we have a, a completely different model that shifted on us, but we had always thought there was some great viability for the furniture industry. If they could just figure out how to harness what 3d print could do. Yeah. And really turn it into something. And you've you've done that. And I'm and so I'm so excited. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you here on the show was because oh, you, you we're like, finally somebody did it. <laughs> well, he's doing it. Yeah, we're still yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah indeed. Doing indeed. it, well, yes, of sure. course. It's, mean, always, <laughs> it's always a process, yeah. right? I mean, nothing's yeah. ever done. There's always more opportunities. That's one of the things that I love about design is you know, there's mm -hmm. there's always more to explore and figure out. But to to use this new process and material the way that Eames did with, you know, curved ply material right. at the time um, at the top, is yeah. certainly exciting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. really is pushing the edge, really. Well, and, and that's also part of it, too, is to that point, like you were saying earlier as well, where 
like you're asking about the design and strength of parts and such, right. you know, much like with the bent plywood and the fiberglass of like the mid century era, you know, you need to have the uh, abilities of the material and form the aesthetics and, and vice versa mm -hmm. to produce interesting looking good stuff. Right. So, um, so yeah, so we're heavily in the design on the design side because, you know, we can't just take like, uh, you know, a standard design for something and just simply 3D print it, you know, it, it, at, at this we scale. We know that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and so that is part of the, the challenge on the design side of what we're doing. And to that front too, the trying to make things that are wildly customizable in a lot of complex ways um, also really changes. Uh, that's another, that's the second leg of the stool, if you will, of the three things that we're trying to do really different is that uh, we're doing everything is being done with, um, you know, like using parametric design, computational design, people have a lot of different terms for it. But essentially, you know, we're like scripting all these objects. So, you know, a, a lot of these things are not designed in a very traditional fashion where you might have a designer that's just sketching things out or working very loosely in 2D and 3D and then handing it off to like a design for manufacturing team that's then working through all of those issues and then it goes out to actual production. Our process is a lot shorter and also um, a lot different because we have to be like, okay, like this item, like what, what are the rules that are going to govern this whole family of products, uh, you know, and what, and how is that going to, and how is this going to work in terms of like the sizes that are available and the materials that are available, um, the options that are available, what's going to be something that's going to resonate with a customer, what do they not care about, you know, in terms of like being able to edit or change and make, make, you know, and all of that. Um, so, uh, so it's been interesting in that regard, where we're using a lot of, you know, kind of procedural and parametric CAD tools, uh, you know, obviously, like Rhino and Grasshopper is really heavily featured with what they're doing. Um, we've been actually um, playing around some with a uh, uh, there's some of our products that we're working on for more limited run business to business sorts of things where we're leveraging Houdini, uh, which is amazing. I, I felt completely fell in love with Houdini, <laughs> like, um, which is a, you know, is meant for the special effects video industry. It's not even necessarily a tool that's utilized very much in CAD at all, um, but is like wildly parametric in terms of how how it can uh, and and is kind of a really stunning in what it's able to do. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we're doing in that realm that is really different in terms of our product development um, process. Uh, you know on the design side so wow. and, you, also, and you're still running a really tight ship of being able to have like one to two month design cycle so that's yeah. pretty impressive yeah yeah well and part of that is because you know we're able to just directly prototype things at full scale so um sure. you know so it'll be like okay we'll we'll you know design a new lounge chair uh that's the outdoor lounge chair we'll you know look we'll iterate through things we'll have a couple design meetings and then we'll just fab a full size one you know, and test it, see how it sit in it, see how it works, see how it works. And that's the other third leg of the stool is the, um, we have a very tightly integrated group of marketing design and production all together uh, at the same time, you know, so, and part of that's easier because we're a tiny startup, but at the same time, that's something that we're setting up to as we scale and grow to re remain true um, throughout. The company so instead of having some furniture companies which are like 90 percent marketing and a little bit of you know design and production and uh you know and having those groups be totally separate silos you know or even in some cases you know it's all marketing and the designers are actually licensed independent designs that are getting purchased you know what i mean and then and then brought to market which is also if really there's common design the at all <laughs> if there's design at all which is really common in the furniture industry right? yeah that's yeah. what um, most people don't realize there's like styling yeah. not design right it's become yes. all too common as it went more to you know an import process yes. of retailers in the u.s going and shopping and buying furniture in other then, countries to import rather than having designed and built what they wanted to sell it's it's an entirely different thing and you know that sort of goes along the lines of what you were you were saying a, a couple of minutes ago or, or getting to it seems is i always admire design that is taking advantage of new technologies new manufacturing processes new materials but is not ruled by them meaning the, the when you look at a design it's not obvious that oh, here's the type of machine that was used to make it. 
and mm-hmm. they did as right. good a design job as they could given the limitations of the equipment right that's right. entirely different thing when it seems for at least from a trained design eye looking at your line that you're really trying to embrace the new materials and the manufacturing process to create something really unique that yeah. stands on its own we we are like um we've gotten some great like when we were pre-pandemic when we were able to go to design shows more and show product more the it was not uncommon for us to get a response where somebody was like oh that's really cool look at that thing that's really great and then we would say yeah and it's 3d printed and then they'd be like oh my god i didn't know it was 3d printed because most people don't know that something's 3d printed you know off the bat uh so yeah so we were trying to have this just be interesting on its own you mm-hmm. know not interesting because it was three happened to be 3d printed yeah <laughs> well i think so i think so just to recap your three-legged story you've got the on-demand yeah. piece which i i think is really you know i i would also say i'm going to call it flexible low inventory piece because you do yes. have to have the pellet inventories and you have some yeah, inventories, raw material. but you've got so. inventory that's completely flexible for you to be able to turn right. it into something so you're not really right. it's not wasted inventory which is really important exactly. and then yeah and then you've got the piece of the the way that you're designing parametric and computational design and then mm-hmm. you've got this sort of integrated team of sales right. marketing design engineering all together working yes. towards the common goal of which you're paying careful attention to the market fit, which is mm-hmm. really a critical piece there. So, I mean, yes. I think you've got, you know, a pretty stable three-legged stool. <laughs> I think, I hope so. <laughs> you know, I'm the, so just, I, I forgot to kind of, uh, so I'm the CTO. Uh, I, I, I own the stack, if you will, of like that computational design and the, and the fabrication side of things. And, uh, and we've hired some awesome awesome people on the marketing and retail and sales side of things, you know? Um, so yeah, so I, I hope it's a good, you know, three-legged tool, obviously. Um, I mean, we're feeling really good about it, but um, at the same time, you know, we're trying to get into this very saturated market and it's very challenging. Because, well, yeah. it's very interesting. Furniture is one of the oldest markets and oldest kinds of products that exist on earth. If you think about it, I mean, yeah. as long as, you know human beings have walked the earth they've needed a place to sit and a place to sleep and maybe at first there was no furniture but very quickly after like the wheel (laughs) if not if not before came a place to sit uh or things like that so it's it's always been this it's this oddly seductive market because you create such beautiful forms and everybody needs it on the one hand and on the other hand everybody needs it everybody has it it's it is one of the most crowded markets you could enter so it's yes. challenging. But at the same time it's been some of the most unsuccessful business outage out, outings so you know there's a lot there's been lots of investment groups who decided they'd go into furniture in the in the 90s that happened we had a ton mm-hmm. of people in investment companies thought they'd enter the furniture industry because hey we know furniture we understand it we sit on it each day we buy it right and they right. sorely underestimated the marketing side of that and the mm-hmm. inventory side of that and they underestimate these things right, right? and yeah, so well, like, it's yeah, always challenging like, yeah absolutely because one one of the other factors too is that um returns actually on for a traditional furniture company uh returns are a huge issue right where you know just the the cost of dealing with returns is is uh you know painfully high for a traditional don't get me furniture started company. on our return story <laughs> right so right. It's um, like so and, and the consumers have the same like frustrating experience yes. with the return process yeah. because everything's so big right so by the time mm-hmm. we get it home we assemble it or we install it like it's it's problematic yeah yeah and so we're hoping i mean so far the experience has been bearing out but our hope is that our model and how we're going about this helps minimize the returns quite a bit and so far it has you know um which is which is fantastic well it's really if it's if 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 it is truly custom made for or custom is the wrong word uh made on demand for the individual customer um you know, maybe there's an opportunity to involve them more and maybe you're doing this, Mm -hmm. but in the fact that, Hey, your, your chair is in manufacturing right now. And maybe here's a time-lapse video of it being printed. And if you give them more of an ownership of this one's for you specifically, then there's, you know, more of an attachment they form to it where Mm -hmm. they're not Mm -hmm. so easily gonna, you know, uh, judge it, too quickly or or you know there won't be so much buyer's remorse whatever the number of reasons are 
that might cause someone to want to return a piece. And that, I mean, that's a, oh, go ahead. Sorry, that's okay. You, you know, that's also a really great strategy in raving. And raving is an extremely important part of getting furniture and companies who produce great furniture to get that brand recognition, which, as you say, it's so saturated. It's so difficult to compete mm-hmm. against someone who's been yeah. doing this for 50 years absolutely excellently, right? Right. But right. when you get someone who's raving about the experience of it, now you're really coming through into a place of you've got to try this, right? You know, mm-hmm. now you get to be that like breakthrough Warby Parker kind of thing you know, where Mm -hmm. you're really breaking into what was such a saturated market when you didn't really realize that over time, that brand had actually eroded in value. There are very few brands, Herman Miller's an exception, as we've talked about them multiple times. But, you know, Bernhardt used to be an extremely amazing brand. And it's deteriorated in value greatly based on the designs that they're currently making, the extended lead times, the next generation doesn't get Bernhardt. Mm -hmm. And so they haven't transcended like they could. Yeah. Well, you see the same thing. Yeah. And you see the same thing in like um, different fashion brands, different fashion labels, Mm -hmm. you know, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't, um, they don't always last the test of time into the next generation. Like we think mm -hmm. we are, because a lot of it is also, we're not handing down the furniture like we used to, you know, we have, we have some stickly or we have some, you know, we have some, oh gosh, I can't, I'm trying to think of some of the stuff we have gotten that over the years from our grandparents, but our kids are like, what? It's just, oh, like, um, well, the (laughs) the companies don't exist anywhere. Like, like maybe Hitchcock, we got some pieces yeah. but of course we also have some mid-century modern eme stuff that is gonna and they'll happily take that one us, right <laughs> but right. yeah that hasn't it had the hand-me-down part of it because some of them are not as well made they don't last as long is isn't there as well so you don't have that generational that it used to have a long time ago so i i actually think the the furniture market is is at this disruption point so you're coming in at, again at a right time of that they, they they aren't there's going to be a whole lot of it that doesn't make it through this this mess that they're in right now of, yeah. of low supply. So. Oh yeah, and and also when you get right down to it, I, it may sound kind of oversimplistic, but I think really it's the kind of idea where it's like just coming from our architecture, it's like okay, the buildings that people love are the buildings that tend to stick around, just mm-hmm. in terms of the sustainability side of things, right? You know, it's like if people really love these products that we're producing because to your point they, they were made for them they were involved in its creation like it's part of their story and there's a story there that they're connected to then um then they're less likely to just toss it right and that also helps the overall kind of sustainability mission that we're after so very yeah. much so yeah it's a it's a very it's something that we're very aware of and think a lot about uh, how how we can try to make that Well, as you make more of those entertaining pieces and people are out going into other people's homes, now you have a better shot at getting people to like, oh, let me tell you the story about my dining table. Let me tell you the story about my my lounge chair, right? Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Indeed. (laughs) So you don't just have to rely on Instagram at this point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, Jeffrey, I, I'm really impressed with model number. We are we are just really impressed with everything oh, that you've you. created there. And we want to have a check-in at some point, see how things are going. Sounds and, great. And uh, yeah, keep us posted on as you get new materials in and some of those other things. We'd love to do just to talk about how you're using those new materials too, I think would be really valuable for the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's some exciting stuff that we're working on right now, actually, um, with Oak Ridge National Labs around material recycling and uh, also new printing technology that helps us increase the strength of the F- of the uh, FDM style prints significantly. Um, so I'd love to talk about in the wow. future when we get it. Okay, we'll definitely, uh, we'll definitely do that. Uh, as, yeah. as you're going to kind of have a new line out that's using that, then we'll come and talk yes. about it. So then everyone can hear about it and go check it out and buy some new, new made to order uh, model member furniture, right? That sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> sounds great. Well, thank you again. And we look forward to seeing what comes next. Right, thank you. Oh my gosh. It was fun to talk furniture. It was refreshing for me. <laughs> I mean, we've designed furniture for the majority of our careers. Um, not so much lately, but wow, it was fun to see somebody else doing something that, you know, we consider doing ourselves, aspired to do, but but more importantly, we really respect what they're doing. Yeah, you know, this is the thing. Look, things have come across our desks before. Like, it's not the first time somebody, or across our mic, right, where somebody wanted to talk about 3D printing furniture, but we were like, we really realized quickly that they didn't know, they didn't even know what BIFMA standards, and you heard Jeffrey mention that in the topic today, BIFMA standards. These are the Furniture Manufacturers Association standards. They're voluntary, but they are so common in the industry. 
And reality is from our perspective, if you don't even meet BIFMA standards, you don't meet the minimum requirement quality to really be safe in someone's home. So the fact that they're already cognizant of that, they're doing that, then great. They already have a leg up on so many others who come out of the 3D print angle only and know nothing about the application and furniture. Do they just think, oh, having a 3D print furniture company would be cool? This isn't the case here. Jeffrey and, and his companies before have been building custom furniture. So they already understand the challenges of what people are looking for, what they want. And now they're looking to expand that to make that more mainstream furniture, like all kinds of choices that you can make. You know, what did you, what did, what did you find most interesting, Tom? You know, I found most interesting that the real overall mission that they have in not only what company they are today, what company they want to be going forward. And they want to be a company that's around for the long term. They want to create designs that people buy and keep that are more heirloom like pieces of furniture, right? Right. The philosophy that they have, I think that's a critical factor to the furniture companies that have withstood the the test of time, right? They've withstood changes in the marketplace where the market dipped and where it grew again. But the ones that really had a strong philosophy have lasted through that. So I think that I agree with you. I think that's really an important part. One of the most exciting things for me, though, is the seasonality opportunity. Like he kind of mentioned it because he talked about we're working on outdoor furniture right now. And of course it's outdoor season right now. Right. And then we're going to work on, on, you know, on sofas and, and living room furniture. Right. Because we're going to, we're going to nest back up as fall hits. Right. The being able to hit the seasonality of things in a better way and not having to plan out two years in advance or at, you know, some of the lowest cycles we ever worked on was maybe nine months, but that was like iterations was of stuff that though. already exists. It, yeah. Right. I mean, I would say we're, we're very commonly 18 months to two years out in designing furniture. So you're so beyond what's happening from a trend standpoint, what's happening in terms of seasonality. You're off of that so often in in the regular production of furniture world. They have such a great opportunity to be more seasonal, be more current, but not losing the, the perspective on the philosophy. And, you know, it's also really exciting to see a company that isn't playing the mass market distribution game where you have to make some real wild guesses as to how many of something you're going to sell. And you have to design it, design it to sort of appeal to everybody, which means it might appeal less to everybody because it's so vanilla, but that you're going to, you know, what happens, Tracy, when we go to Costco and we see something we like, if we don't buy it right then in a week, it's going to be gone. But here you've got a company that also based on the seasonality, Hey, it's warmer weather. Oh, we really need some outdoor furniture. Hey, here's a company. You can order some, they'll make it on demand and ship it to you now. And you don't have to worry about, you know, did they plan and order enough? And is it in the stores in time or is it delayed in the port being imported? I mean, forget all that. But, you know, and I think this is really actually where they're, when they move into more contract furniture. And when we say contract, that means selling to businesses, right? Selling business to, to business office furniture. Right, right, business to business office furniture. And I think that's where the success is going to lie for them is in that exact niche area. Because what happens is, is that in that furniture, it's like, look, we have an office here and we have X number of employees today, three months from now, we want to go buy more furniture. And it doesn't exist. It's gone. It's out because of the way we bought it. So now we have the only choice we have is to buy from contract furniture manufacturers. You never discontinue this stuff. And the pricing might be completely out of range for us. And even they discontinue things at various times. And so well, you don't know also, how many years out you could go where you can't match your furniture anymore. And your traditional office furniture, you know, contract furniture manufacturers like to have a really big contract for a big company for hundreds or thousands of sets of things. Whereas here you can, as a small business, you know, or an individual, you could, do a dozen. You could buy, you know, as many as you wanted and you just, order what you need and then order more later, like you said. Right. So I, I think they have some great potential to hit a real niche in the marketplace that is just not being filled there too. So I think they they have what they they have what it takes as a base and philosophy in, in that three-legged stool that he talked about. I think that they have what it takes. And I think the biggest benefit for them is actually the economics of not having all that money and risk in your company in inventory. 
So that is going to help them be a much more sustainable business from a business model standpoint. So this is the perfect kind of 3D print company. I'm so glad to see it happening. And so glad that all these things have started to converge and things are getting even better for them with new materials and other things. So we'll have to have Jeffrey back. Yeah, I, I really want to keep an eye on this company, see where they go. It's very exciting. And, um, you know, it really hats off to him. Great job. So, so Jeffrey McCrew, uh, model numbers, the company, all the links for this, plus those special videos we mentioned where you can see some of them get built, which you can't see always on their website. So they shared a couple of great ones with us. Those will be in the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. But Tom, we have something new coming up too. We do a new podcast that you all might find very interesting. So we call it the next little thing, and we're here to review and uh, give some recommendations on great products and services and apps and technology and different things that we find that aren't the next big thing, but the next little thing that makes our life so much easier. The things you rave about every single day that you tell all your friends like, or that you might better yet, you buy them as gifts for everyone you know. And sometimes the next little thing just might be the next big thing. So at least that's the way we look at it. That's right. You never know. So you'll check out the next little thing wherever you listen to podcasts. um, And you can, or you can just type in Thompson, my name, and you'll find all the different podcasts that Tom and I host. All right. Well, hey, hope you enjoyed this one. We'll be back when we have another great subject to share with you, another great advancement or something cooler or, you know, really hot in 3D printing. So uh, stay tuned, stay subscribed. So make sure you get it. And uh, we will see you again in the future. This is Tom and Tracy Hazard on WTFFF.